Well, we're continuing our series on faith because you guys need it, okay? <laughs> Last week, I made this comment about, hey, let's be praying for the Dallas Mavericks because they're heading into the conference finals, and clearly our prayers are not effective enough because they're getting stomped, okay? But that's all right. God can turn any situation around. Maybe, maybe there will be a miracle here. If not, it's going to be okay. But we are continuing, that's all a joke, by the way, but we are continuing to talk about faith. Last week, we talked about faith to wait. Tonight, we're going to be talking about faith to stand. And all of this is under this umbrella verse that we see in 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 3, or sorry, v- chapter 1, verse 3. And Paul writes and he says this, he's saying that we should always be thankful for you because your faith is growing abundantly and your love for each other is increasing. Your faith is growing abundantly. Your faith is growing. The, the reason we're going to be talking about faith over the next, tonight and, and next week, is for faith to grow in us. I want my faith to be growing. Okay, faith is not this stagnant thing. Faith can grow. And I want to have a faith that's growing because I want to fulfill all God's plans and purposes for my life. I don't want there to be something left on the table that God intended for me, but I didn't have the faith to step into it. Okay? I want to fulfill all God's plans and purposes for my life, so I want to continue to grow in faith. You can have faith, you can have different levels of faith for certain things. Just think about all of the things that you had faith in on your way to church tonight, okay? You got in a vehicle that you trusted would work, okay? Depending on the quality of your vehicle, it may have been a great faith, it may have been a little faith, but you had faith that your vehicle, you'd turn it on and it would get you here. You had faith that the roads wouldn't collapse under you, which in some places requires more faith than others. Uh, If you crossed over a bridge or an overpass, you had faith that it was going to hold you up. If you came to a stoplight and it was, you saw green, you had faith that on the the cross traffic that it was red and that the people were going to see it and obey it, okay? Which is the greatest act of faith while driving is you put your trust in other people on the road that you've never met, okay? Okay? And you trust that they're going to stay in their lane, all right? You had trust that we were actually going to have service tonight. So just simply all of the, and you could, you could dive in more detail than that, but simply all of the things that you had faith or that you trusted in, just simply between you leaving work or your house and arriving tonight, there were multiple things and there are varying degrees of those things. So for example something that you probably had so much faith in that you didn't even inspect was the quality of an overpass that you went over or the road that you drove on. You probably, the thought never crossed your mind of, I need to make sure that the road's not just gonna swallow me up, okay? So you had a great amount of faith for that, whereas, you know, maybe you rode with someone here and... And you had, you know, you had to put some faith in them that they were going to get you here safely. Or you had less faith in the people driving on the road with you on their phones, you know, while you're trying to drive and them swerving into your lane. Uh, You had less faith for them than you did for, again, the road, Uh, not swallowing you up. I want to have a faith in God that is more like the faith that I have in the road not swallowing me up than I am the faith that I have with other drivers on the road where I'm kind of skeptical. Like I don't, I can't really trust you. So I'm going to keep my eye on you. And that's how a lot of people are with God because they either have been taught wrongly, they've had poor experiences and they just simply don't know God well enough to know that he's trustworthy. I want to grow in my faith in such a way that I can walk the way that he's laid out before me without a second thought of his faithfulness because he's trustworthy. So that's why we're talking about faith, growing in faith. Uh, Hebrews 11, verse six. Another reason I want to grow in faith is because without faith, it's impossible to please God. 
So 11, Hebrews 11 verse six says this, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe. So if you want to draw near to God, you must believe, you must have faith that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. And what we're gonna hone in on tonight are two things, both of them are represented in this verse that has to do with drawing near as well as pleasing God. And like before, we're gonna be following the story of Elijah. So Elijah is seen as a person of faith, an example of faith. And last week, we looked at the story of Elijah, who's a, a prophet, and we're introduced to him in 1 Kings. And, uh, and in his story, we see that he shows up onto the scene, he prophesies a drought, the drought happens, and because of this, he is not very popular amongst the, the leadership of the nation of Israel, King Ahab and Jezebel. They don't really like him, kind of puts him in hot water. We talked about God sending rain last week. And uh, at this point in the story, we're gonna be picking up in 1 Kings 18 verses 20 through 40, which is the showdown at Mount Carmel. Well, if you want to grow in something, so whether that's personal growth and development, whether that's growth in your business, all of these different things, when you think about like growth and how to grow, you don't, all, you don't only need to be thinking about what to add or what strengths to maximize, what weaknesses to improve, you also need to ask the question of what's in the way. So when you're wanting to grow, you have to ask the question of what's in the way of my growth. And so tonight it's gonna be framed around two specific barriers to growth when it comes to growing in faith. Okay, so again, we're gonna be looking at the story of Elijah. We're gonna be picking it up in 1 Kings 18, verse 20. So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, how long will you go limping between two different options? If the Lord is God, then follow him. If Baal is God, then follow him. Okay, so here what's happening is Elijah has been obedient to God and uh, God told Elijah, go present yourself, go show yourself to King Ahab. And we're gonna confront Ahab because previously for the, the prior three, three and a half years, Elijah has been in hiding because God told him to go into hiding. Things have changed. God told him, go show yourself to Ahab. And he's done so. And Elijah is... Uh, he comes to Ahab and he said, hey, I want you to meet me at Mount Carmel and we're gonna find out who the real God is. And so Ahab gathers all the people together. So all of the people of Israel are here. And what Elijah says is he, it says that he came near to them. And then he said, how long are you going to continue limping between these two different options? Okay, the first barrier to growing in faith is double-mindedness, okay? So barrier number one is what the Bible describes as double-mindedness. And it's what's happening here, okay? Double-mindedness is not the same as being indecisive, okay? So it's not the same as, uh, how many, well, I don't know if I'll do a show of hands, we'll see. <laughs> Things that indecisive people may do may include things like changing multiple times your outfit before you select one and wear it, okay? Anyone, anyone that person, like you try on, if it's for like a, a wedding, an event, something special, you try on about four or five different outfits, okay? You don't have to be ashamed of it, okay? It's fine. And then you, you go, okay. And then sometimes you like end up landing on the, the first thing that you put on. Um, it's not indecisiveness or another, I'm the kind of person that I want to know all of my options before I make a decision, okay? Some people are like, we'll figure it out on the way. Let's just get this thing going, okay? I'm more of the, what all's out there? What are all our possibilities? Let's, let's explore all of them 
and then I'll select one. So what it looks like for me is whenever I go to select a movie on some sort of streaming platform that has tons of options, I spend more time looking for the movie to watch than it would have taken me to just watch an entire movie, okay? Because I got to go through them all. Well, I don't know what, I, what I'm feeling tonight. Let's see what they have to offer, you know? Or it's like when you go and eat at a like Cheesecake Factory. If you've ever done that, their menu is like a novel. It's like 10 pages long. And uh, you get analysis paralysis in situations like that. But what those are all kind of surface level things. Double-mindedness is not necessarily just being an indecisive person with things like what to wear, what to eat. There's something deeper going on here. And double-mindedness, it's a combination word. And the, the combination is between two words, one being die, meaning two, the other one being psychos, or we just actually just, sorry, we just got out of a series on this subject. Uh, Antoinette spent three weeks on the, the psyche, which is the Greek word for heart. Um, so the deeper thing that's going on here isn't that you're just, you have two different, depi- uh, two different opinions on what to wear, what to eat. It's that your heart's in two places. Uh, you're trying to have a foot in two worlds. Uh, your heart is divided between the way of the world and the way of the Lord. That's the bigger problem here. And that's what Elijah's calling them out on. And he's saying, how long are you gonna continue limping between these two different options? Okay, Elijah here is specifically calling them out on idolatry. You're, when convenient, you give your heart and your trust to Yahweh, the God of Israel, and when convenient, you give your heart over to Baal. And we can very easily distance ourselves from these ancient concepts like idolatry. Uh, And we think just because we don't have this little golden statue that we have enshrined in our house, idolatry is not really something that we deal with. And I mean, it couldn't be further from the truth. Idolatry is still very much something that we deal with. Timothy Keller puts it like this in a bit more relatable, modern concept, his description of idolatry. He says, an idol is whatever you look at and say in your heart of hearts, if I have that, then I'll feel like my life has meaning. Then I'll know I'll have value. Then I'll feel significant and secure. Yeah, so you may not have any little golden statues in your house, but do you have any idols in your heart? Anything that you look at and when you brush off all of the, the answers that you're supposed to say, whenever people ask you those questions, but when you really get to the, the, the heart of the matter and you really get deep, and you ask yourself the question of, is there anything in my heart, in my life, that I look at and I go, if I just had that, then I would have meaning. If I just was with them, if I just had that thing, then I would feel secure. I would feel like I had a sense of purpose. Uh, Augustus, or Augustine, sorry, St. Augustine, I didn't put this quote in there. But he, he considered idolatry worshiping anything that ought to be used or using anything that ought to be worshipped. Worshiping anything that ought to be used or using anything that ought to be worshipped is what Augustine considered to be idolatry. And, I mean, we're all, we're all guilty of this, and so I don't say that to beat you over the head with it. It's just a matter of awareness, and, and asking the Lord to search our hearts and see if there's anything in there that should be a place in our heart reserved for him that we're looking elsewhere uh, for that sense of purpose or meaning or security. The, the verse here that addresses this, you're going between two opinions, it also uses this phrase, come near. I highlighted it in the verse for a reason. Because whenever we look at this concept of double-mindedness or going back and forth between these two, uh, these two 
values and being divided in our heart, there's a common phrase that you'll see in different places, and it's this phrase, come near or draw near. And it's for this reason. If you have a foot in both worlds, and the, the image here is you're trying, to walk, uh, you're trying to walk two paths and keep a foot in both paths at the same time. So if we're walking, if we're doing life, and we're saying, this is the ways of God, over here is the ways of the world, and we're trying to ride the fence, we're trying to keep a foot in both, and our heart is divided, the invitation from God is draw near to me because he knows that we can't be double-minded. We can't have a loyalty in two places. That's not what fidelity or faithfulness looks like. And so he's inviting us, come to me, come near, draw near. And we see this language here, uh, James 4.8. So James is addressing this in his letter and he's told them, hey, listen, I don't, I don't know why, but you know, a lot of times people think that they can be friends with the world and friends with God. And he said just a few verses earlier, he said, friendship with the world puts you at enmity with God because the world hates God. So you can't, you can't walk in both worlds. You can't have a heart uh, loyal to both because they're at war with one another. And so what James says to those who are dealing with that and trying to walk that out, he says, draw near to God. Again, draw near to him and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Uh, that's, I'm sorry. Tell us what you really think, James. Uh, this, is not, this is not John writing this letter. Dear brothers and sisters, dearly beloved children of God, this is James writing the letter. He's like, clean your hands, sinners. Uh, pure, so what he's saying is the things that are visible, your behaviors, the things that others can see, uh, those need to be clean. They need to be in the ways of God. And then he said, uh, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So James talking to people that are double-minded, remember, double-mindedness is a barrier to you growing in faith. So what he tells people who are dealing with double-mindedness is he tells them, purify your heart. Soren Kierkegaard, a Danish philosopher, uh, he said that purity of the heart is to will one thing. Purity of the heart is to will one thing. Um, you can also think of the parable of the sower and how uh, the third thing that, that damages the seed, the seed being the word that's being sown, uh, the third category is the thorns and the thistles. And among that is the, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things. When, you, when your heart desires or it is double-minded and there are things that you are looking for that only God can fulfill and these other things crowd your heart, it chokes out the word in your life. And it's, what is, how does faith grow? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. And so the word that's getting sown into our hearts can get choked out because we're, we're distracted. We're double-minded. James encourages people to draw near to God, to purify their hearts. And in this moment, Elijah is not double-minded. He is drawing a line in the sand and he's saying, I, it's, it's a black or white issue. Like it's black and white. It is not nuanced. If Yahweh is God, follow him. If Baal is God, then follow him but you can't do both. You can't serve both God and Baal. Jesus said you can't serve both God and mammon or money. You've got to pick a master. And so he's drawing a line in the sand and he asks the people, you know, how long are you going to continue hobbling between these two different opinions? And this is like when 
when you get in trouble and your mom gets on to you and you know like she asks you a question, like you're busted and she asks you a question but you know she's not looking for an answer? Uh, like this is a rhetorical thing. You just need to like put your head down and just take it. So Elijah asks this question and the people don't have a response. He said, okay. And we continue and he said, on the second page. So uh, the rest of verse 21 into 22 said, and the people didn't answer him a word. And then Elijah said to the people, I, even I am the only prophet of the Lord left, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Okay, the first barrier to growing in faith is being double-minded. Second barrier is people-pleasing. So imagine the social pressure that Elijah is facing here. He's doing what he's doing. He went and presented himself to Ahab. He's doing this because he's being obedient to what God told him to do. And it has put him in a place where he is standing alone. And it's not just 450 people. Remember, the entire nation is gathered here. Imagine the social pressure that he's facing in this moment. If there was a musical score to the song right now, it would be All By Myself by Celine Dion. (laughs) And I would sing it for you if you'd never heard it, but we just don't have time. So we're going to move on. But the social pressure that he would be facing of doing what he knows to be right, being obedient to God while nobody else is. And at this point, he's facing the decision of do I go along with it or do I remain faithful even if it costs me uh, people's approval rating of me, okay? Following Jesus is going to cost you people's approval rating of you, okay? If you value or seeking the approval of people more than seeking the approval of God is gonna stunt your spiritual growth. Jesus in John chapter five, speaking of Jews who were seeking to kill him, they weren't very happy with him. Jesus said, how can you believe, how can you have faith when you receive glory from one another and don't seek the glory that comes only from God? How can we have faith, how can we grow in faith whenever what we seek is the praise that comes from other people more than the praise and the approval that comes from God? You can't. And this is really hard for the people pleasers. People who have a, a just your personality has a bent towards, I want everyone to be okay all the time. And I want to make everyone happy. This is more difficult for you if that's your personality type. And there's a saying that, that goes along with this. I heard someone say, if you live by others' praise, you'll die by their criticism. That you can't have one without the other. If you place such a high value on what other people think or say about you. It may be great when it's positive, but whenever it's critical, it'll crush you. So, if we want to grow in faith, we have to get past people-pleasing. And we all desire to be approved of. I don't think the desire to be approved of is, is wrong or needs to be adjusted or eradicated. What needs to be changed is who you're seeking the approval from. John later comments on unbelief and its connection with seeking glory from people. 
So this is John chapter 12. He said, nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him, him being Jesus. So they believed in him, they had faith in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. So they would not be put out of the synagogue for they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. They had faith, they believed, but their faith didn't grow because they were more afraid of the Pharisees. They, were, they put a higher value on the praise and the glory that came from people than the praise and the glory that came from God. There's nothing new under the sun here, okay? This dynamic that was present in the first century with the Jewish people is still present in the world today, okay? That if you don't conform to the world's definition of right and wrong, you may look at it and you may believe, when you, when you look at how the world defines what's right and wrong, good and bad, you may look at that and you may go, like, I, I'm not buying that. I'm not buying it. But what we're seeing is people, okay, I'm not gonna get into all of this, but there's still a degree of Pharisee-like activity uh, not even a degree. There's a whole lot of Pharisee-like activity in the world going on today. A sense of self-righteousness. That if you don't adhere or align to my understanding of right and wrong, then I'm gonna come after you, I'm gonna slander you, and I'm gonna kick you out of the synagogue. The place where we all gather and worship. This is still happening today. And... What, what, are you, what are we going to do about it? Are we going to seek or desire the approval that comes from people more than the approval that comes from God? Proverbs 29, 25 says that the fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. The fear of man is a snare. It's a trap. It's a trap because here's the trap in seeking to please people is it is impossible to please everybody all the time. So if you live your life in an effort, if you pour out your life, if you spend all your energy trying to please everybody all the time, you are gonna wear yourself out, okay? Because it's impossible. You, you can't do it. And it's a trap. And so here we see the fear of man being contrasted to trusting in God. That if you have a fear of man, if you seek to please people, it is in opposition to trusting in God. Fear of man lays a snare, but the one who trusts in the Lord is safe. Is safe. For some, how many of you would consider, I, well, I just kind of painted people pleasers in a really bad light. But we'll still do, still do a show of hands. How many of you, like, people pleasing is, is a struggle for you? Okay. It is for me, has been. Like, growing up, the fear of man was a big deal in my life. I wanted people to approve of me. I wanted to... Uh, I wanted to make the good grades to do all of these things so that I got the approval from other people. And so many of us, this is a, a struggle. It's something that we deal with that we have to work through and walk through uh, because there could come a point to where even the people in your life that matter the most, their, their opinion of you or their approval of you would be different and damaged if you were to be obedient to the things of God. So I think of a friend of mine from India who grew up in a Hindu family and 
got radically born again. Beautiful testimony. Part of his testimony is that his dad continually beat him for confessing Jesus. And so for him walking that out is he had to come to grips with disappointing his dad, which is a very difficult thing for people to walk through. No one wants to be a disappointment, but whenever it comes down to faithfulness to God or the approval of people, I'm going with faithfulness to God. As much as it may cost, as difficult as it may be, and I'm not gonna get that 100% of the time, but that's the direction I went ahead. And that's what we see Elijah here doing is he's drawing a line in the sand and he said, I'm going to stand with Yahweh. Wherever God's at is where I'm gonna be. And I'm going to continue to stand even if I'm the only one here standing. Even if I'm the only one believing, I'm gonna continue to stand regardless of whether or not my approval ratings go down. I'm gonna continue to stand. Few remarks on this. Um, So the desire to please God more than man doesn't give us a license to be a jerk, okay? So a lot of people may, may use that as an excuse to just be rude and be like, this is how I am, deal with it, okay? Paul addresses this in Romans. We're not gonna get into that, but Paul talks about this and he he says, this is not how it's gonna be. So that's one thing. Another thing is when when we follow Jesus, our aim, the target, the thing that we're after needs to be to please God. Uh, Just like Hebrews 11, what we read at the beginning, without faith, it's impossible to please him. The aim, the goal, the objective in, in our lives, in my life, I want to be to please God. Because again, we have this desire to be approved of. We have this desire to please someone. The, the question at hand is, whose approval are you seeking? Uh, Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 5, 9. He said, whether we're home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For Paul, his aim, his goal, his objective, his target was to please God. And here what we see in the story of Elijah is the same thing. Regardless of what it's gonna cost me, my aim is going to be to be loyal and to be faithful to Yahweh and to please him. So now we're gonna pick the story back up into uh, 1 Kings chapter 18. So Elijah is trying to turn the hearts of people back to God. And what he does is he said, okay, well, meet me on Mount Carmel and we're gonna have a showdown. Mount Carmel is this mountain that's located between Israel and Phoenicia. So between the two lands that are in question, the the God of Israel, the God of Phoenicia, and Carmel's located there. And Carmel was considered to be a sacred dwelling place for Baal. So it's, it's a home court advantage for Ahab and all of the prophets of Baal. And he said, we're gonna meet at Mount Carmel and what we're gonna do is you go ahead, we're gonna, we're gonna decide this by selecting two sacrifices. You go pick a, a bull. I'm not gonna choose it for you. We don't wanna tamper or rig this, this deal here, okay? We're gonna let you go pick it. And once you pick your bull, prepare it for sacrifice. Cut it up, all of that, place it on the altar. I'll go do the same thing. You call on the name of your God. I'll call on the name of the Lord. And whichever God answers by fire is the true God. Baal, one of the things that Baal was known as was that he was depicted in images as holding bolts of lightning. And so Baal was considered to be Lord of fire. And so not only is is Elijah saying, we're gonna do it on your own turf, but he's also saying, you know what? You say that your God is the Lord of fire. Well, we're gonna, we're gonna prove it. I'm gonna, pl- I'm gonna beat you at your own game, is what he's saying. And so 
the prophets of Baal, they go, they grab their bull, they cut it up, they prepare it. They spend all morning crying out to Baal for the sacrifice, nothing happens. And then around noon, Elijah kind of starts poking at him. And he said, you know what? Maybe, maybe Baal is just off musing or maybe he's off relieving himself, which is a nice way of saying maybe he's taking a bathroom break and it's taken a long time. Um, <laughs> sorry, I just had this thought. I used to, to wonder why it took so long to use the restroom for, for grown men. And then I had children. And I realized that it doesn't actually take 45 minutes to use the restroom. Uh, it just takes 45 minutes to gain your sanity back. Um, so he's saying maybe Baal is, maybe Baal's off using the restroom. Maybe he's off on a journey or maybe he's even falling asleep. Um, and at this point, it causes the prophets of Baal to, to lose it even more. And so for the next three hours, they start acting even crazier, uh, doing all of this, dancing and everything, and even to the point of cutting themselves, trying to get Baal's attention, and no answer, no reply, silence. Verse 29 and as midday passed, they raved until the time of the offering of the oblation, and there was no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. In this, Elijah isn't just acting as a prophet, but he's acting as a priest, because it was the priest's role to offer the sacrifice. Priests, we just got out of a series not too long ago about being royal priests and how priests represent God to creation and represent creation to God. And so in this continual phrase that we see in the story of coming near, that was the role of the priest, to come near to God on behalf of the people. And so Elijah here is priesting and he's inviting people as a representative of God to the people, he's inviting them to come near to him. And all the people came near to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. He took 12 stones representing the tribes of Israel. And at this time, it's a divided nation. Yet he took 12 stones, put them together. He prepared the bull for the sacrifice. And before he prayed, he said, you know what? Go and fill four jars of water and pour it over the sacrifice. This is at a time when there's a drought. Water is a precious commodity. He said, go, go fill four jars of water, pour it out. So they did. He said, do it again. So they did it. He said, do it again. 12 jars of water poured out on this. Elijah didn't want there to be any question or any doubt who the true God is. Uh, origin, uh, so that's a name, origin. Uh, early, uh, one of the, the earliest Christian theologians saw what's happening here as a type of baptism where man is the one who is placing water on the sacrifice, but it's gonna be God who sends the fire. He had them repeat this three times and in verse 36, and at the time of the offering, of oblation, so this is in the evening between three and sunset. Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. So not only is the prayer, God, let them see that you're the true God, but the prayer is also, let them know that I'm not crazy that I'm your servant, that all of these things that I have walked out on the plank, so to speak, that I've went out on a limb here for you, let them like back me up here, God, okay? This is, this is a prayer of faith, okay? Because whenever, whenever, whenever you walk in faith, you find yourself in this kind of spot of, Lord, I've gone out on a limb here and I think that every step has been in obedience to you, but man, if this thing doesn't turn out well, 
I'm going to look like a fool. Okay, people are going to look at me and they're going to be like, what was he thinking? What an irresponsible thing to do. A lot of times, faith looks like irresponsibility. Okay, sometimes it, like, sometimes irresponsibility is irresponsibility. Okay, so it's not licensed to go out and just do anything. But oftentimes the steps that we take in faith don't make sense. So whenever we're standing in faith, we're gonna be looking around and we're gonna pray that prayer of God, please show up and show them that, that you are who you say you are and that I'm not crazy for following you. And verse 37, answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, O Yahweh, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. Because that's what all of this is about, is the hearts of the people drawing near to God, and the heart of God drawing near to the people. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord is God, the Lord is God. Yahweh is God. And so the Lord in this moment, in Elijah's prayer, contrasted to the prophets of Baal that spent all morning, half the afternoon, crying out, trying to get the attention, begging and pleading for their God to do something, thinking that maybe if we just say the right thing, do the right motion, show our pain enough, God, Baal will do something. Elijah's prayer, standing in faith, having a confidence, a conviction, an assurance that God has said it and every word that God has said will come to pass. He said, Lord, hear me, answer me. It's like a few sentences, it's a few words, and that's all it took. Fire falls from heaven, despite it being soaked, all of that, it consumes it. And so here on the, the mountain, Carmel, the place that was a sacred dwelling space for Baal, uh, Yahweh shows up. The Lord of fire just got beat at his own game. The instrument that he used, Baal, the instrument that he tried to use, just got usurped. God took it and used it to defeat himself. This is what God does. He has a way of taking territory and gaining ground. He has a way of taking deserts and dry places and turning it into an oasis. He has a way of taking stony and cold hearts and turning them into burning hearts that burn with passion for him. He has a way of taking graves, places of death, and turning them into gardens and places of life. He has ways of taking instruments of death, a symbol of death, and turning it around to become a symbol of life for every generation after it. This is what God does. He did it then, and he's doing it now. 